you all for coming to this talk. Um, I'm Nishant Shivasto. I'm an I'm Android Philip engineer Bavich. at Berlin. And yeah, this is my name is Philip Babich, and I'm from Croatia. Yeah. And we'll be basically be talking about uh, coroutine recipes, basically small bite-sized uh, practices and, and gotchas that you literally see when you are working with co Kotlin coroutines. So the thing is that Kotlin coroutines is a big term now because everyone is working with it. Uh, it's been stable for some time now. And we have this new version coming up all the time, like they are making some advances, all this stuff, right? But what people don't care about is that what is the right way of doing things? And that's what we'll be covering here. To begin with, I'll start by giving this to. Uh, so the default thing you want to learn or know how to do when uh, using coroutines is how to launch them, right? You can't really use coroutines unless you launch them. So I'll be talking about that. Um, there's a couple of ways you can actually launch. No? OK. Uh, you can launch coroutines. There's the standard sender builder core called launch, which makes sense. So it simply launches a coroutine with some default context you have in your coroutine scope. And that's a lot of terms, so uh, let me simplify it a bit. The coroutine context is like a set of rules your coroutine use. So it's the way the coroutines behave. Uh, when they run, in which thread they run, and you know how they handle exceptions. Uh, and then there's this coroutine scope, which is the lifecycle component of coroutines. So how long they run and you know uh, when they get canceled. So the standard launch builder, um, no? no, okay. This. So the center launch builder is pretty simple. You just say launch, that makes sense. Uh, you give it some context, and then within uh, this block of code, you can do some work. You can uh, access the coroutine scope you launch the coroutine in. So you can uh, launch nested coroutines or maybe do some other work. And you can, you know, of course, do some work. So it will be launched in a different thread depending on the uh, coroutine dispatcher you use. So you can launch this in the main thread as well. Uh, or the background thread, the IO thread pool, and things like that. So it just depends on the coroutine context. And that's the basic builder which you're uh, going to use most of the time. But there are different cases where you might use something else, like the async builder. Um, this is also called the deferred builder because it uh, defers the value of production into a different thread. And then you can await that value and uh, consume it later on. So deferring is the process of let's say promising a value, which is why it uh, is constantly compared to promises and futures in JavaScript or Java. Uh, basically, you promise that there's going to be some value in the future, and once you call await, uh, you get that value. So the builder would look like this. You opened up uh, the async block, and you assign it to the deferred value. You can do some work in between, so maybe some computing, maybe some parsing, things like that, in some thread, depending on the coding context. Uh, but at the very last statement, you can define uh, which value will be returned. So if it's a string, it's going to be a deferred value of string, or an int, or something else you want to do, right? Uh, once you call await, you actually get to that value. So this block of code is executed immediately. It's uh, run in parallel with the rest of the code. And uh, if it manages to get to the la last line of code, or like the value computation, when you call await, you will get that value immediately. Uh, but if not, then when you call await, the rest of the code will be suspended and uh, the coroutine will wait for the value to be computed. So uh, either way, you don't really waste resources or block anything. You just wait for the value until it arrives, right? Uh, there's another very similar builder to, to async and await, and it's called with context. Um, I like to say that it's also a synchronization primitive, so it's a mechanism you can use to synchronize two threads. Uh, basically, it says, okay, I'm going to produce this value in another thread, and then I'm going to synchronize it back to the call calling thread. So whenever you want to do like an API call or something like that, you can just say in your main thread, for example, uh, with context and some context, for example, the ba background thread context, I want to do some work again, and then in the last statement, you want to return some value. When this block of code is done, uh, you can continue with the rest of the code. But until the actual uh, block of code uh, finishes, the rest of the code will be suspended and once again wait. So inherently, it's more or less like async and await immediately, but uh, you know it's a bit cleaner because you don't have to call await all the time. And the last builder we kind of want to go through is called uh, with timeout. Uh, the name kind of says it. So it's a coroutine which has some timeout, uh, and if that timeout finishes with but the coroutine doesn't, 
it, you will get a time uh, timeout cancellation exception. So the coroutine will be cancelled and you can handle that error. So it's really useful for time intensive work or something which has a delay. So for example here, you know, you can call with timeout and 5,000 milliseconds or 5 seconds. Uh, you can do some work and call an expensive operation. If everything is done within 5 seconds, then that's fine. If not, it will cancel the coroutine and you will get an exception to, to handle. So that's about it, about launching quarantines. Uh, one thing about async is that you can use it in many different ways, and Munition will talk about how to properly use it. Yeah, so what's been happening is that uh, we know about all these uh, coroutine builders, right? We know launch, we know async with context, with timeout and everything. But what is not very much clear for people to understand is that why do you actually need async and await mechanism? Uh, so let's look at this code that is like the correct way of actually using it. It's a bunch of code, so we'll gloss over it uh, slowly. So I have this function called do some work, right? Uh, it's basically running a while loop and trying to like compute some values, and then when it's done, it's basically going to return back. And then I have this section where I'm creating these multiple tasks using async, right? And they are all going to be running in parallel. Uh, you have task one, task two, task four. All of some of them have do some work function called, and then they return some sort of like a string back. And then at the end, there's this section that basically awaits on all of these values and then concatenates them and prints it, okay? So that's the correct way of doing it because the, the, the semantic way of saying that you want to use an async core between builder is that you have multiple parallel tasks that are running and then you want to wait on all of them and eventually get the final value. So that's what we are doing here. The final result, as you would assume, uh, it's like it's, uh, it's going to be like task one, task two, task three, task four, because all of them has finished, and then the result was printed. Uh, the, the wrong way of doing this, and that's like the unnecessary way of doing this, is that when you call the async and, and await instantly on it. You see, so you're doing like, you're saying my task is starting, and it's going to run in the async uh, coroutine builder. It's going to do some work, and at the same time, I'm immediately calling await. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get something, and I'm, I'm waiting at that same point itself, trying to get the value instantly. So that just goes against the semantic meaning of using async await. So that's why it is like not the right way of doing it. Uh, this has no performance uh, benefits or anything. It's just semantically this is wrong. Right? So the end result is anyways going to be task one, task two, task three, task four, all concatenated together. So nothing different in general. Uh, one other alternative that exists is, is that you can use with context, as uh, Philip was already talking about. It's inherently like kind of feels like async and then calling await instantly. Uh, but the problem here is that uh, with context means that you are going to be switching your thread, right? When I say dispatches.default, I'm saying that I'm going to go to dispatches.default thread uh, and then I'm going to run my task, right? So this is possibly something that you can use, but uh, like the right way of using async is that when you actually want to be awaiting later on. So the end result for this is again going to be same. There's no difference. It's going to be task one, task two, task three, task four concatenated. Uh, but obviously you just want to be sure that you are writing code that's more readable and is also semantically correct. Uh, that because I'm talking about dispatches here and, and uh, how we use it with the coroutine builders, I want to also mention this one thing that uh, people do this all the time, right? So a uh, cu couple of people that I've seen and I've looked at code bases that have like, they use suspend functions by s assuming that it's going to get a certain uh, dispatcher. Uh, when I say dispatches, by the way, dispatches is like us saying which thread it's going to be running on. So when you launch a coroutine, you say launch and then you pass dispatcher.main, you say you're launching a coroutine on the main thread. You say dispatchers.io, then you are going to launch a coroutine on the background thread. So let's look at an example right now. So on Android, this is pretty common stuff to see that you will have a suspend function that you created. Uh, it's like you say fetch data from remote, returns a result. On point one, basically it's saying on the view layer, go and start showing show the loading bar. Uh, on the second one, it's basically running another coroutine uh, that is going to run on the background thread, dispatcher.io, uh, and do some work is using the similar function that I had. Uh, for this one, right? And then on the third point, you have something that you can say like, okay, I'm done with my work, go ahead and hide the loading bar. Now, the problem here is that, that you can see that this, this is running without explaining which dispatcher the view is going to be running on. So when someone actually calls this later on, they will call it from, say, using launcher, uh, launch with dispatcher.main, everything is going to work because 
Yes, we are defining it, it's to be running on the main thread. But when you try to call it from launch dispatcher.default, it crashes. And that's what is interesting because it comes from this point. As I said, view.show loading should be like run on the main thread, but we assume that all the time when the fetch data from remote will be called, it will be called from the main thread. So we should not be assuming things here. Uh, the better solution for this would be that you actually define your, uh, your uh, dispatcher on which your code needs to be running. So it just safeguards on top of it. So what I basically did was I basically added a with context dispatcher.main by explicitly saying that I want my view.show loading and view.hide loading to be running on the main thread. While my result uh, uh, that is already running on the background thread is still working completely fine. So when I try to run this with the same code that I had earlier, like launch with dispatcher.main, everything works as usual. Uh, when I say launch.dispatcher.default, again, everything works as usual because I already set my view code to be running on the main thread. Now, what, what I also want to mention is that uh, I did call like dispatcher.main inside the with context, right? Uh, it has some uh, like a potato kind of a gotcha, uh, which I let Philip take over for this. Yeah, so uh, if you think about the code that Nishant uh, mentioned and uh, showed you, uh, you're first switching to some, to some thread, like it can be the main thread or the default dispatcher, and then you're switching to the main thread, and finally you're switching to the IO thread to actually fetch some data. Um, this is quite complex, and it introduces a lot of overhead because you have three context switches and possibly three coroutines, right? And this is why you should try to prefer uh, using the main dispatcher on Android, um, if, well, since we'll, we're Android developers, because if you default to a non-main dispatcher on Android, you can create a lot of bugs with the UI. So uh, the good thing about uh, the example Nishan showed is when the app crashes, because you know you're not doing something on the main thread uh, when it's supposed to be. But you can also like freeze your app or introduce some other behavior which is not that uh, feasible or not that visible to, to understand. So you're, be, you'll, you're going to be like, OK, why is this happening, right? Um, this is why you should always try to force the code to be on the main thread uh, by default, and then switch to different threads when you need to fetch some data or, or process something. Um, and because the UI updates have to be done on the main thread, it works out of the box, right? So let's take this or like a similar example. Uh, let's say we want to launch the coroutine in the background because we want to move this off the main thread, right? And then we fetch, fetch something from the IO thread or IO thread pool uh, from the repository. That's fine, uh, but then again, in the end, we have to switch back to the main thread to actually show the data. There are three dispatchers here, three context switches here, and that is both cognitive overlo uh, overload to your, you know, end overhead, to your colleagues, to yourself. But it is also overhead to the system because it switches threads three times to display some data on the UI, right? Which is not something that should be happening. But it's also like a problem because what happens if you forget to launch uh, or the, the last piece of code, which is uh, showing the data, on the main thread? Well, then you will get the crash or some behavior which is not really defined, right? Um, this is really a problem because, you know, Things can happen, and we're developers. You write this code, and you might write this code like a thousand times, and the thousand and first time, you might forget to switch back to the main thread, and things will, uh, you know, crash or f break something. And you know, the overhead of actually switching the context so many times and switching the thread so many times, and the overhead of having to remember to switch back to the main thread is something you shouldn't really worry about, which is why you should. Okay. <laughs> Ooh. Okay, <laughs> which is <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, great. that's cool. Okay, which is why you should try to uh, always default to the main dispatcher. And in this example, you're just calling launch, and you know that it's on the main thread. You know that this code will work out of the box. But then when you switch back to a different thread to fetch some data, it works fine, and you might think this will block the thread or something like that, but it won't. As soon as you switch to the, uh, to the dispatcher's I.O. using with context, since it's a suspend function, it will suspend the outer coroutine, which is uses the main thread, uh, meaning it will free up the main thread for the rest of the work until the data is there. Once the data is there, it will just show, uh, show it on the main thread. So there's no um, 
like system overhead or no computing overhead, and there's no overhead to the actual developer because you know you just launched some data, uh, some function, fetch the data from a different thread, and display it. It's pretty clear to understand this. So yeah, as I mentioned, once you switch back to the IO thread with uh, with with context, uh, you suspend the rest of the code and uh, the thread is not blocked. So you can you know continue doing stuff on the main thread without actually adding any overhead, and that kind of uh, creates a new gotcha or a new caveat because the main thread dispatcher is not always main, like it's not always immediate, and Nishant is going to talk about that. Yeah, so what we have been like seeing that we have been talking about other dispatchers now, right? So we are progressing in that direction. Uh, we've been talking about dispatcher.main should be like implicit at least for Android developers because we have a UI stuff and most of our things work on the uh, main thread. So I'm gonna show something that's related to this, like dispatcher.main. Uh, consider this very basic code. You have an uh, onCreate function, and I use my global scope to launch a, a, a coroutine on the dispatcher.pane. Okay, so onCreate is basically inside an activity or a fragment, right? So what that means is that my code is already on the main thread, and then I go on to say that I'm going to launch a new coroutine with the dispatcher.main set on it, and then I'm going to print cats and print docs. So what do you think the result will be for this one? I'm all already on the main thread switching to the main thread again, and then printing cats and dogs. Uh, you're saying there's no need to switch the context, right? Yeah, but, but in this particular case, what do you think would be the answer? What do you think? Cats and dogs, right? Uh, turns out that's not how it works. <laughs> the dogs win here. Uh, the cats are far behind. And that was weird for me, too, because that's the ideal case. Like you are going from the main thread to the main thread, and nothing should change, and it should basically just print cats and dogs. But it did not do that. Uh, the answer, actually, if you will, you'll have to dive deeper into the code base uh, and, and the documentation for co coroutine dispatcher. Uh, there's this function that they implement. It's called is dispatch needed, and it is used by all the coroutine builders, right? Like whenever they are going to be doing this, they will ask. Am I going to be needing to dispatch this event? So when I say dispatch event, think of it as, as scheduling the coroutines, right? It's not going to right away execute the coroutine. It's going to dispatch a message to execute this in the later time. So if you read the documentation, it says pretty clearly that it returns true if the execution sh shall be dispatched onto another thread. The default behavior for most dispatcher is to return true. That Second sentence is important because it's been defined by them that we should not change this default behavior. So ideally, if we were to do this by saying dispatcher.main, at this point, is dispatch needed should have returned false, right? But overriding it is the wrong way of doing it because the default is already defined for you. So what, what people came up with and, and, and uh, the, the Kotlin Android dependency actually came up with is that they now have something called dispatcher.main.immediate. So Coming back to my old code, this is what it looked like. There was dogs and cats, right? Um, Change very quickly. Yeah. So now, instead of passing dispatcher.main, I'm, I'm explicitly saying that I know I'm on the main thread. And I'm going to say dispatcher.main.immediate. And that basically tells the core routine that don't check the is dispatch needed. Just go ahead and execute it. So this is very specific to the dispatcher.main. Uh, as, a, as a dispatcher here. And we are basically saying that I'm going to do the immediate one and just go ahead and execute the coroutine. So now my result is what I would expect. Cats win here. Cats is shown first, and the dogs are shown next. Um, because we are also talking about these dispatchers and coroutines and everything, uh, this also brings me to the next topic, which is handling cancellations when you are running multiple coroutines. Now, what happens is that you have these coroutines that you spawn up now and then, right? And then you are running them. but in Android side, think of this, that you're running this, and then your activity goes out of life cycle, right? It goes into on destroy, and your core routine is running. It tries to come back, you have an await somewhere, and it crashes the app. That's a problem, because most people actually would either go ahead and just cancel it randomly, like cancel every other core routines, or if you don't have the reference, you cannot cancel them right away, right? So you have a core routine that's running in the background. So the usual way of doing this or handling cancellation is to use a job. Right. This is a pretty common stuff. Like, there's nothing gotcha here. It's basically when you have a job, you have a like, say, a launch coroutine builder. It will return a reference to a job, and inside that job, if you have multiple coroutines running, this job becomes the parent, and any children under it will basically get cancelled if you cancel the parent itself. Right. That's the common stuff. The documentation talks about it. The the gotcha here is that 
when a child in itself gets like cancelled or fails during this process of running inside a parent, it will cancel its parent too. And from the last definition that we learned, when a parent gets cancelled, it cancels its children. So recursively, it will go ahead and cancel all your children's too. Children core routines here. So let's look at code for this. So I have this code again, a bunch of code here. <laughs> I'll gonna highlight the parts important. So I have I take a reference from the launch and I put it inside a val here job. Uh, inside it, I'm running a repeat for 1,000 times. So I should have like 1,000 of these with context dispatcher dot io coroutines, basically running background threads 1,000 times. Uh, and then later on, I go ahead and say I'm gonna cancel my uh, say parent job here, I'm going to cancel it. And then also I go in and say that the last coroutine that was executing should complete this process, right? So I say job.join. You can also say cancel and join. There's another uh, helper function for it. Uh, the, the point here is that when I'm canceling the parent, I just want to show you that when I do this, the other children get canceled by the time. So you'll see the time that is delayed here before inside the with context is delay 500 milliseconds. Uh, yes, 500 milliseconds. And then later on outside the job, the launch uh, coroutine, I have delay 1300 milliseconds. So I'm gonna just prematurely cut it down. I'm gonna cancel the parent. So my result, as you would expect, is that some of these would run and then the rest of the 1000 coroutines would not. Like I basically cut them down by the time it was. So it basically kills all the, uh, the children coroutines. The other better solution to use though is to use a supervisor job. Uh, because that gotcha that we just learned about that when uh, one of the child coroutines gets cancelled, uh, it triggers the, it, it cancels the parent and pa parent ca getting cancelled triggers other children to get cancelled too. That doesn't happen with a supervisor job. And that's very important because usually this is what you want. You want if your child fails or it, uh, it, it is getting cancelled, then the execution should still go on executing, but you should get cancellation exception, which is what you will get in this case. So it's a more predictable version of using jobs. And, and most people would actually want to use supervisor job. So that's the preferred one. That's what I'm trying to make the point. Um, and because we are talking about all these, like uh, like how the cancellation would work, I also want to talk about, uh, or, or hand it over to Philip to be talking about how can we make them these coroutines lifecycle aware. Yeah, so um, in some of the examples we showed, we had global scope uh, launch, and in others we used uh, different coroutine scope. Um, one of, well, when you're developing with uh, Android or like any other ecosystem, you always have some life cycle. So your applications won't run forever and uh, they will end at some point in time. But it's not just your applications, like in general, uh, different features within your applications will only have a certain amount of time the user will use them. And it's important because of that uh, to be life cycle aware when using coroutines. So you should always try to uh, take your coroutine scope and confine it to some uh, component which can be bound to, bound to a life cycle. So for example, an activity, a fragment, or for example, the a presenter, if you're using some MVP or MV something architecture. And you should always try to respond to life cycle changes. So for example, um, let's say we have a base presenter, uh, which uh, we all use in all presenters, and we want to override or implement the coroutine scope interface. This means that we should be able to use the coroutine, uh, entire coroutine API, the coroutines, in uh, the presenter or any other presenter. Uh, but to override, uh, or actually to implement the scope, you have to override the coroutine context to provide a default context for all, all the coroutines. Uh, in this uh, case, we want to push it on the main thread, so have the main first idea in our mind. We want to use the parent job, as Nishan said, to cancel the exception, uh, or handle the uh, cancellations and cancellation of children. And we also want to use the default uh, like exception handler if we want, uh, want to handle exceptions. Uh, or just like stop our app from, from crashing if an exception occurs. And let's say this is our like ba base setup, but we also want to be lifecycle aware, right? So in our presenter, we can define functions like start and stop. Uh, and in start, we can start up the presenter, uh, reset the job or create a new job in case the old one got destroyed or canceled. And also stop and clean up the scope or the job uh, when the component is destroyed. So for example, in non-destroy we would call stop and in start or in general uh, resume we can call start to, to clean up the, the job and start anew, right? And this will make our code lifecycle aware and we can simply cancel uh, coroutines when we finish with the component or start up the coroutine ecosystem when we start a new component. 
but you should avoid this because, as Nishan said, there is a better way to handle uh, cancellation with multiple coroutines and a better way to handle, in general, can cancellation in your components. And Nishan is going to talk a bit about that. Yeah. So, again, so we have been talking about making it lifecycle aware, so we are building upon this, and the next step to this is because we are saying that there's a lifecycle for things, uh, we are actually talking about the scopes now. Uh, now, when we say scope, think of it as in Android, uh, we have activity that has, has its life cycle. Coroutines define their life cycles using coroutine scope. So that's what it is. Basically, it knows about all the context of like what it is going to be doing, how many jobs are running, and it just contains that inside that scope. Once you are running through that scope, you can like basically call cancel on it, or you can do other things. But calling cancel um, on the scope jobs is not the recommended to do. Uh, I will tell you why. Uh, the problem here is that when you call cancel on the scope, you're basically saying that I'm going to be canceling all the jobs, the children running inside it, like the, all the coroutine jobs that are running, and I'm going to put all the coroutines in the completed state. What that basically means is that from there onwards, if you try to start any more coroutines from this scope, they will, they will never execute. Like They just are on in the completed state. So the ideal way to do this is to use, again, the supervisor job, as I was saying, uh, and use uh, the cancel children on it. That just basically helps you out by not touching the coroutine scope at all. You're managing everything using a parent, being your supervisor job, and canceling children on the job, but not on the scope. Uh, there's another thing here is that, that it, the ability to have like cancel individual jobs is like something of an added advantage, and you would want to prefer that. Uh, that's important because coroutines are running in parallel, right? So they can be running in this, uh, like in some other uh, background thread, on the main thread, and so many other places. And you just want to have the ability to make sure that some of them are actually running in the background, while you cancel only the ones that are on the main thread, right? So you are not saying don't stop all the coroutines, but stop the ones that I want them to stop. So here's an example. Um, I think I saw somewhere in our slides, maybe Philip did this or someone did this. We said global scope dot launch when we are explaining the launch builder, I think. Uh, don't do this. It's bad. Uh, why am I saying this is because it basically represents the whole application lifecycle. So say you are running it on a JVM, the standard Kotlin program. Uh, in that case, it's running for the lifecycle of the program. On Android, it's running for the lifecycle of the application. So you start a coroutine on your activity, but it's using global scope, it's running for the application, activity is destroyed. The coroutine tries to reference the activity again, maybe update the view or something, cannot because the activity is already gone. But the coroutine is still running on the application lifecycle. So that's why it's, it's not a good idea to do that. Uh, the better idea is to use scopes that are limited to specific lifecycles. You can have activity, you can have fragments, you can have view models. And then I also added et cetera because you can define your own lifecycle objects, right? You can create your own lifecycle observers and then, or, or lifecycle based uh, classes, and you will implement the coroutine scope for that specific thing. So here's an example code that we can see. Uh, it's again the similar kind of stuff that you can see. There's a main activity that uh, inherits uh, or is extends the app compact activity. But I added some stuff to this. Uh, there's a coroutine scope that I'm extending from, which Philip already showed you sometime uh, in some slide back. Uh, inside the on create, I'm launching my like do work kind of a coroutine here. And then eventually we we said that we are going to cancel it on the on destroy, right? So we are going to say cancel in the on destroy. Uh, but the better solution, though, is to use the supervisor job, the one that I was telling you. The coroutine scope still exists, but I am now defining my parent job as supervisor job, and then overriding the coroutine context, where I pass in dispatcher.main and the append the job context to at the same time. And then eventually on destroy, I say coroutine context or cancel children. That's the right way of doing it. Uh, so you can avoid all this, like, problems with, with, the, with the scope. Because we are talking about activities and fragments and, and uh, so many other things in the Android world, uh, I also want to touch upon the view model because it's become pretty common. Everyone is using architecture components. Uh, so taking from my last example, I'm going to implement the same thing for a view model. I have my my view model class extending from view model class. Right? And then implementing the coroutine scope, I have a supervisor job, I have a coroutine context where I define job plus dispatcher.main, pretty common stuff. Uh, I have the on cleared where I go in and I say job.cancel children. 
uh, and then I do some action, which is also very simple code here. But that's too much boilerplate code, <laughs> right? So we want to make it better. So it turns out that uh, the architecture components, as they were be being built out, uh, a couple of people reported back by saying this is a lot of boilerplate code, and we want to get rid of it. Uh, this is something that we are doing all the time, and maybe we can have something simpler for this. So you have a dependency that you can add to your Android app. Uh, basically, it's called Lifecycle View Model KTX. Provides you some uh, uh, extensions functions on it. Uh, only works with 2.1.0. Below that, it's not available. I think you can get it with an alpha version, uh, but it, uh, it became stable in 2.1.0. So once you add it, the whole code that I showed you earlier becomes this much. You don't need to write anything because OnCleared is already implemented for you by calling uh, uh, job.cancelchildren. There's a supervisor job already provided for you. The, oh, the coroutine contest is all, already overridden, and all of this stuff is done. The only difference that maybe you want to look here is that the view model scope dot launch is being used. So basically what I'm saying is that from using this dependency now, whenever you want to spawn a, a coroutine, you will do it using view model scope dot launch or view model scope dot with context or any other version that you want to use. Uh, the gotcha again for this is that by default, all launch coroutines will run on the dispatcher.main.immediate because it's assuming that your view model is running on the main thread. So it want to execute it instantly and do no dispatching on this side or the other. Again, you have the ability to override this. You have view model scope dot launch, and then you can pass in a specific dispatcher for this. In this case, we are passing dispatcher.io. The question, though, is when to use this. Well, think of it as because we are limiting it to a screen, any point in time where you want the coroutine execution to be limited or tied to the screen is when you will use it. If you have a case scenario where the user exits the screen, the view model is maybe, say, destroyed, or like the new activity view model is available, then there are two different view models we are talking about. So you don't want to use this there, because you want to define your own version of doing things. Um, and also, the normal uh, idea about how view model works still applies, that if you have a configuration change, the onclear state, uh, onclear function will not be called, so the coroutines will not get canceled either. So that is still valid in this case, too. Uh, and obviously, because we are talking about all these life cycles, we'll have exceptions, right? So Philip is going to talk about the, the how are we going to be handling the exceptions gracefully. Yeah, so uh, we're developers, and it's not that we write bad code, but exceptions just you know happen. Uh, it's something that's going to follow us throughout eternity, I guess. Uh, so you know, you may think of a co uh, of the coroutine API or coroutines in general as a new mechanism, as something which is not uh, similar to anything you used before. So there should be another way to to handle exceptions with them, right? Uh, well, there is. There's actually a couple of ways to do it. Uh, there's a the first way is to use the coroutine exception handler, as I mentioned, which will uh, simply catch all the exceptions. But how does an exception actually get propagated through the coroutine stack? Well, if it's a general exception, every single coroutine in, in the hierarchy will get it. So it will be propagated all the way up to the parent. If it's a cancellation exception, like a specific uh, children, uh, like child got cancelled, uh, if you're using the supervisor job, as Nisha mentioned, only that uh, coroutine will receive it, right? The other was, uh, others won't get cancelled. Uh, so you have two ways of getting the exception, like either the single parent, uh, sing single uh, child will get it, or the entire parent tree hierarchy will, will get it. So you should always try to safeguard against exceptions on your own, and you should always try to provide results or some values in case things go wrong. So the first way or the simple way to do it is to add the default exception handler to, to your code. Uh, by creating a coroutine exception handler, you get the coroutine context and the throwable um, when an exception occurs. So every time the uh, exception occurs, you will get the context it occurred in and the throwable that uh, happened. So you can do some logic here. But let's look at an example. So when I add the coroutine uh, exception handler to my coroutine, if the storage interactor function uh, throws an exception, uh, when will I get it, or where will I get it? Well, it will cancel the entire stack, and your launch block will get the exception, right? But you may not want to cancel the entire stack uh, when things uh, go wrong. So this line of code will break all the entire tree of coroutines, and you will get one exception which you can handle. But you may want to get that exception and handle it somewhere with, uh, in this code, right? You can do that by adding some try cache blocks, but it might bring more overhead to your code because it's you know clunky, and you have to ha add more try cache blocks to every single function you call. 
well, there is a better way, a cleaner way to do it. Uh, you can simply wrap your uh, function calls in run catching. This is not the core in way or API, but this is actually in the standard library. So you can call run catching to wrap some code. It will do the uh, try catch block underneath, and then you can use on success and on failure to handle the result or the value. Uh, if you know you get the value or if you get uh, an exception. So. Handling exception is good, but you can also add some more login to your code so you know in which coroutine you are and what's happening. And Nishant will kind of finish with that. Yeah, so we've been cooking all this coroutine recipes, right? So I wanted to know what's cooking by logging things, right? So the, the general idea is that uh, we're going to start with a block of code again, as I usually do, right? Uh, I'm going to show you the parts uh, slowly. So I have a function here that's called log coroutine info, and basically it doing a standard println function call. Uh, the important part, though, is the thread.current thread name. I'm trying to get the name of the thread here. Uh, and in my main function, I have this section uh, where I'm launching a coroutine printing using my function. Uh, like, it's going to print the message along with the thread name also. Uh, there's a task. Uh, there's task 2. All of them are running. And then I do task 1.await and eventually go and print the result from my task 1. So. The result for this is something like this. You get like an output where it says main started from launch, main started from async task one, and then because I ran it with the with context and dispatcher.io, it says uh, default dispatcher worker thread started from with context IO, right? And then eventually, because my task one was finished, it's going to return done. The ambiguity here is that you can see there are two mains here, right? So I don't know which coroutine ran which unless I printed started from launch or started from async task. If it was a value, it would say main, this value, main, this value, and I wouldn't know. And that's not useful for me, because when I'm trying to debug things, I want to know exactly where these things are happening. Uh, so you, you should ideally always print which coroutine you are doing this, but sometimes able to differentiate if it ran on a different coroutines is also important. So to do that, uh, the simpler version is that you just set a property. It's a very standard thing. Uh, you set the property by uh, like saying Kotlin x dot coroutine dot debug and then setting the property value to be on. Uh, and when you do this, for my whole code, the output result would turn out to be something like this. So now you get at the rate coroutine hash 2, at the rate coroutine hash 3. Uh, and obviously, because my first async task already had done its work, it went back when I was using with context, it used the same coroutine from the pool and it ran on the coroutine hash to itself. So it, it reused my, my second coroutine, which was uh, propagated to this point. Uh, and on the Android world, we just have an extra syntactic sugar here that if you want to do this only on the debug side, you will say if build, de build config.debug, then switch it on. Otherwise, keep it off for your release builds. So we get to log all these uh, exceptions, cancellations, and everything that we are doing while keeping track of which coroutine it's running on. Uh, and because we are, we, are, we are logging so many things, we don't want to do this manual debugging for a long time, right? So we want to do things by doing automated testing. And this is what Philip is going to be taking over for. Yeah, so we have five minutes. Hopefully, I can you know, <laughs> wrap up the whole of tests in coroutines. Uh, also, hopefully, we all write tests, right? Raise your hands. No one? Uh, OK, so there's a couple of ways you can do uh, testing in coroutines. Uh, again, it's a different, com uh, different mechanism, so it may look a bit different than the standard things we do. But generally, you can force the coroutines on the main thread or in just to be blocking so you can test everything correctly. But there's also the, the problem of handling delays and timeouts and, you know, and general time advancement in coroutines, because you can suspend and resume the coroutines at any point in time. right? Uh, and you can also test with mocks. So let's see how, how to set up the, the actual environment. Um, the first and the most basic uh, approach is to use the dispatchers unconfined. This basically means it will run in any thread which, it called, which you called the coroutine in. Uh, if you do it on the main thread, it's going to be, to be on the main thread. So tests will work more or less out of the box. But you might have to swap this out for actual dispatchers in your production code, right? So you can't really swap it out easily. Well, if you provide it from an external dependency, then you can. So you can create your own context provider and provide the coroutine context anywhere you want. And for tests, you can use a, spe a special uh, provi provider which provides the test context. So now you're in your code, you can simply re rely on the context provider. And you can simply switch it between tests and production, right? But there's, that's not just it. There's a couple more things you have to do. So you first have to create the test dispatcher, right? And the test coroutine scope you want to run the function in. 
uh, the tests in. You can also provide like the background or the main thread. Uh, sorry, um, the main context providers in case you have multiple switches in your code. And then you, when you set up your tests, you can set the main dispatcher to be something else because the tests in Android don't really run on an Android environment er, and there is no main dispatcher. So you have to set it to something else. In this case, the test dispatcher. So you basically fake it. And finally, because you use whenever and verify and things like that from other libraries, you have to actually call the uh, suspend functions from your code, but you can only call them in a coroutine or another suspend function. This is why you can use run blocking test on the coroutine scope and simply avoid that. So it will be behave like a coroutine. Additional thing you can do is uh, in tests is delay the stuff you want to happen to see if your code is still performant with delays. Uh, and run blocking test helps you to advance the time so you don't, don't actually have to wait for a second or two or three in your test. It just advances the time and you know it behaves normally. But you can also advance time by yourself manually by calling advance time by. So this is more or less what it takes to set up uh, quarantine tests, right? And it's a bit of boilerplate code. So this is why mock exists. It's basically uh, a library which is used to test quarantines. Uh, instead of writing all that code, you can simply use co every and co verify to wrap the run blocking test and uh, a general time advancement. You can say co every, so every time something is called, some suspend function is called, return something, or co verify when some that some you know dependencies was called. So with all this, I guess we can finish within time limits, <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's all from us. So. One thing we want to like uh, give you is the, the materials to learn. So of course we have to mention our book. <laughs> you know, the name is here. Yeah. So uh, we wrote a book with Ray Wenderly on Kotlin coroutines, and it has a lot of content in about coroutines in general, about uh, some examples you might do and Android applications and things like that. And there are some other references here which Nishan can mention. Great. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask. <laughs> uh, we came up with a lot of uh, coroutine recipes. Uh, if you have more recipes, you can just send it to us, right? That's also possible. 